I'm Sandy Starr and I'm Deputy Director of the Progress Educational Trust, or PET, an independent charity that seeks to improve choices for people who are affected by infertility or genetic conditions. I'm very pleased today to be speaking to Professor Robin Lovell Badge, who among his many other titles is the current Chair of Trustees here at PET, is a senior group leader in stem cell biology and developmental genetics at the Francis Crick Institute. And the reason I'm speaking to him today is chair of the guidelines task force of the International Society for Stem Cell Research, which has just published important new guidelines. Before we dive into the detail, can you remind us what a stem cell actually is? The essential feature of stem cells is that they, is that they have the ability to self-renew, so that's when they divide to give another copy of themselves, same sort of cell state, or to become specialized, so differentiate into one or more different cell types. Pluripotent stem cells, which have in, in theory the ability to give any cell type in the body. Now these are stem cells that correspond to cells in the very early um, embryo. So they are embryonic stem cells um, are derived from uh, early embryos around the time of implantation. These are cells that have been taken out of their natural environment, put into a, a lab environment, uh, where that you can then maintain them indefinitely. The same would be true of embryonic um, stem cells from the nervous system. These are fairly short-lived in normal development, but you can extract these and you can culture them in defined conditions uh, and grow them indefinitely. As a, as a sort of fixed state. And what is the International Society for Stem Cell Research? It's um, so an international society. It has representation from scientists all around the world. And um, it was decided uh, fairly soon after it was created that it would be important for the society to issue guidelines that would help, um, if you like, uh, uh, give a, um, a view of the types of research that should be permissible, uh, provide, if you like, a, a safe space with, within which scientists could do their work, and to provide some reassurance to the public that, you know, that science should be within these boundaries. And these guidelines, do they only cover research or, or are there clinical uses that are covered as well? It depends on your definition of research, but we, we really cover clinical, clinical research as well and, um, and applications. So it does go all the way from basic fundamental research through to uh, clinical research and then beyond into clinical applications. There are, as you may know, that there are um, a, a lot of clinics that are being set up around the world that offer unproven, often completely bogus um, treatments that uh, are, are actually dangerous for, for patients, but often patients are so desperate for some uh, solution to their problem that they will pay large sums of money. Uh, and that's really bad. So the one thing in the guidelines tries to do is to dissuade those clinics, um, rogue operators, if you like, um, from, from operating and also to dissuade the public from using their services because it's, uh, it's, it's not good for that. Uh, people who do um, get treated, uh, quotes treated in these, these clinics, and it's not good for the field because it, it brings it into disrepute. And so the society is, is constantly trying to find ways of dealing with this problem. Am I correct in understanding that these, these guidelines place various uses of, of stem cells in, in categories that range from uncontroversial or relatively uncontroversial at one end to completely prohibited uh, at the other end and then there are certain gradations between those two. So yes, yeah, so we have uh, different categories. So the, in the 2016 version there were just three categories. Category one which was uh, essentially no special review required. Um, there may still be review of experiments so if they involve animals of course they would go to the relevant a committee that's looking at experiment, animal experiments in your institution or within or, or even nationally in the case of the UK. Um, you've got category two where you have to have this specialized review and oversight process um, which is uh, designed to look specifically at uh, the more if you like the more challenging types of, of research where there may be ethical questions uh, and things like that. And then you have category three 
which is, is experiments that should not be permitted, at least now. But we made it a little bit more complicated this time. So we divided category one into two. So it's, you, know, you now have one A and one B. So one A is where there's, there's no need to report even the experiments you're doing to um, the specialized uh, review and oversight process or committee. So that these will be things like uh, just culturing embryonic stem cells or other stem cells in vitro. Then you have category 1B, where again, the research doesn't have to get, doesn't have to get reviewed by this process, but um, it should be at least flagged to the, to the committees doing it because it may be of public interest. It, the results may suddenly jump from something that didn't require review into something that did. And so that's why this committee should be aware of the research that's going on. And then in category, um, category three, you have, we've divided that also into two, uh, two parts. There's category three A, which is where there may be a scientific rationale for doing the work, um, but it is not yet sufficiently safe or there are ethical issues that need to be resolved and or it needs um, a proper dialogue with the public to get, if you like, uh, consent from the public to proceed with these things. And then you have category 3B, which is, if you like, absolutely banned um, because there is not only are things unlikely to be safe, but uh, there's no real strong scientific justification or validation you know, valid reasons for doing it. Presumably that, uh, that, that final category you mentioned, we cannot at present foresee a, a strong case for, uh, for that use of stem cells, but of course, presumably we can never say never. So the guidelines, well, so it's five years since they were last um, updated. And the, you know, the plan at the moment is that they will get updated in another five years and, and things will change. So perhaps we can look at some of the specific areas that are discussed uh, in the guidelines um, beginning with uh, research using embryos proper um, and the 14 day rule, which is this, uh, well, a rule in some places, a law in other, other places, including the UK, uh, that an embryo cannot be cultured in the laboratory for longer than 14 days from the time it's created through fertilization um, with that clock stopping if the embryo is frozen and stored and then starting again if, if the embryo um, is thought. Yes. Um, so has the society played a role up until now in sort of upholding and promulgating that 14 day rule? The last version of the guidelines that was written in 2016, still, very, as, as did previous versions, um, it, still, it had the 14 day rule uh, in place. And so taking embryos in culture beyond 14 days or the beginning of gastrulation, uh, which is this important process that occurs then, uh, would be prohibited. So they were clearly in category three. So uh, this time we have moved them from category three to category two. However, though, and to do those, um, we're not giving a free license to go and do those experiments. They're heavily conditional on two things. So conditionally first on there being a proper public dialogue within the relevant jurisdiction that um, so you get some idea of what the public might permit in, in that. And, um, and, and secondly, uh, they would have to go through this robust um, review and oversight process where the details of any proposed experiment would be looked at in, would be looked at and judged whether or not they were acceptable. And that would have to include uh, assessment well is the science valid is the you're using the minimum number of embryos uh, possible um, the minimum culture period possible to give you your scientific results that you're after so it, it would be um, conditional on both those um, things and of course it has to be legal in the jurisdiction so in the uk we can't we couldn't do it anyway even if you had both those things until the law was changed. Uh, in UK law, it's a sort of two-sided rule where, where the embryo cannot be cultured beyond 14 days or beyond the appearance uh, of a feature called the primitive streak, which is associated with the, the gastrulation process 
um, you mentioned. Um, is it is it the same thing in the guidelines? Is it those? Is it a, a double rule where whichever one occurs first at that point, the embryo cannot be cultured any longer? When does gastrulation actually begin? Is always a difficult thing. If you if you look visibly, you you can you can see the primitive streak as a visible sign of gastrulation beginning. But actually, if you were to use um, uh, molecular markers of this process, so genes that are become active um, in early gastrulation. These will, you'll start seeing these being active before you see a visible sign. But we've always coped with that and in the UK and it's essentially it's that, you know, it's that visible appearance of a, of a streak that's important. Now, um, you might ask, you know, you might ask why on earth do you want to do experiments beyond 14 days? There are many, many reasons. Um, so this, the, this process of gastrulation, so which begins with the formation of primitive streak, is where you turn the embryo from a single layer of cells, unspecified epiblast cells, into initially three layers where, where you have um, endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm. And these, these three germ layers uh, then give rise to all the different cell types in the body. This period, um, in particular between 14 days and let's say 28 days, is, is critical for uh, all sorts of things. And we, we have very little understanding in the human. Um, so whenever, whenever people have been able to look at things, it looks like processes are, are not well conserved with other animals, including non-human primates. Um, an example of that would be actually one of the first cell types specified uh, during gastrulation are the primordial germ cells. So these are the very early germ cells that are going to go on to form later germ cells and eventually sperm or eggs. So this is the formation, if you like, of the next generation. And we actually have no clue how that arises in humans. You can sort of mobilize ethics in two directions uh, in relation to this, because yes, there are ethical difficulties and questions involved in going beyond this uh, established 14 day limit. But uh, I believe these, these embryos used in research are often donated by fertility patients uh, following the completion of their treatment. And so one imagines that there might be an ethical imperative to learn as much as one can from these donated embryos, rather than perhaps being sort of compelled to destroy them before one has learned everything one can from them. I think it is unethical not to do the research, that would be my personal view. Well, I see that in the guidelines, there is reference to stem cell based embryo models. So there's ones we refer to as non-integrated stem cell based embryo models. So this is where you, you start with uh, usually pluripotent stem cells, which could be embryonic stem cells or these induced pluripotent stem cells. And by culturing them in a particular way, they can acquire um, pattern and, and development, uh, developing as, if you like, part of a normal embryo. The other class are these so-called um, integrated stem cell based embryo models where they have stem cells that are not only going to give rise to the embryo, embryonic parts, but also to the extra embryonic parts. We need to validate whether these models are actually corresponding to anything that goes on in a normal human embryo at these stages, these post gastrulation stages. And so the only way to do that is actually compare them with um, normal human embryos that you've maintained in culture uh, up, to this, up to the same sort of period in terms of development. Now, the embryo models, you can't possibly apply the 14 day rule anyway, because 14 days is nonsense, because you may have grown these, these stem cells in culture for many months before you, you try and turn them into, an, into your embryo model. So 14 days wouldn't count. You could argue, well, how about the stage? Let's say we, we stop them you know, at the point where they're going through gastrulation, but they're not embryos. They are absolutely not normal embryos. And so it's generally felt that these should not be subject to quite the same uh, rules as a normal embryo. Entities uh, which resemble to a greater or lesser extent embryos, yes. be they human or non-human, which have been created from stem cells, they haven't been created via conventional fertilization. Uh, and these are what you've called stem cell based embryo models. Yes. And you've divided them into two, which you've called integrated and non-integrated. And, and the main difference is that the integrated versions, uh, they don't just resemble embryos, they, they, they potentially resemble the, the entire conceptus, uh, the, the embryonic tissues and 
the, the extra embryonic tissues required for ordinary development. They are definitely beginning to resemble what we think is happening in a normal human embryo, then I think it's important that we, we uh, um, clearly include them in the guidelines, have them looked at properly, if necessary, by these oversight and review committees. The guidelines do not propose seeking to apply the 14-day rule or the primitive streak rule to these models, partly because there is no moment of fertilization to count from, and partly because you don't think they are sufficiently similar to human embryos for that to be justified. They may mo model um, aspects of normal human development, but it's really unlikely that they would ever model an entire human embryo or even be, or be capable of developing as a proper embryo if they were transplanted. But we make it clearly a very, you know, it's a category three band, a 3B band experiment. You could not transfer these into a, into a human or animal neutrals. And speaking of human and animal, um, let's move on to the combining of, of human and animal material. The sort of simplest way of combining human cells with, with animals uh, are things like, which have been going on for decades, where you, where you introduce uh, a small number of human cells into an animal, which could be an embryonic or postnatal animal. And they are, you're asking, well, what can these cells give rise to in that environment? Uh, do they function? So, for example, you can trans transplant some human uh, nerve cells or neural stem cells and ask you know, then can those give rise to nerves? Do they integrate into local circuits and things? And that's been very valuable research to say for, for a long period of time. You can have um, chimeras where you have um, mixed things in earlier. You can, for example, have introduced, let's say, human embryonic stem cells into a mouse uh, embryo at early stages and you're looking for a contribution. We know that that contribution is going to be really small, at least certainly experienced to date. And so do those experiments require review? Well, we think they do. A lot of these things that we've been talking about are ways of, if you like, modeling human aspects of human development and cell function in a way that we cannot possibly do with just humans. If you propose to do an experiment where you wanted to replace the central ner entire central nervous system, of a mouse with human CNS. Now you have to ask, well, would that be a bad thing? Well, certainly it would be an animal welfare issue if you ended up with an animal that didn't behave like a, a mouse. If you were to do the same thing, um, not using a mouse as a host embryo, but uh, let's say a non-human primate, a macaque, uh, then, um, then again, the guidelines suggest that that's allowed, but it would really have to be subject to tough oversight. Uh, you would have to do it in a step-by-step -step manner. So you would you know, have these embryos develop a little bit, have a look and see what, what was going on, how normal they looked, how abnormal, what was happening to the human cells in the context of the animal. And of course, you could never transfer any of these chimeric embryos into a human uterus. That would be absolutely banned as well. You could transfer them to an animal uterus, see how they develop, you can also um, maybe get quite a lot of information just culturing embryos um, in vitro. I noticed that in UK law, very different rules apply. In fact, entirely different areas of law apply to researchers, depending on whether they are working with entities that are predominantly human. If you had a, a, um, a chimera that's developing from an embryo, embryonic stage, which is mostly animal, then that's largely the remit of your animal ethics committee to, to look at. Clearly, if it's uh, mostly human, or if you have a particular sensitive tissue developing, such as germ cells or uh, the brain, then that would fall under this oversight and review process. Is there um, a challenging situation where you could begin in one category and find yourself in another category as the entity develops. This is so-called blastocyst complementation. So this is where you have a, a mutation in your host embryo, which stops an organ being developed. So let, let's say the pancreas. So you have a mutation in a particular gene that stops, stops that embryo, host embryo developing a pancreas, a mouse pancreas. So you then put, let's say, uh, well, rat cells, and that's those experiments being published. You put rat embryonic stem cells into that early mouse embryo. Uh, those rat stem cells don't have that mutation, 
they can give rise to a pancreas. And so you end up with a chimera who now has entirely rat pancreas. That doesn't cross your 50-50 boundary. But if you were, let's say, to take, um, do the same thing with a central nervous system, so you could, in theory, end up with an animal with an entirely human central nervous system. And the CNS has many, many, many cells. And so at some point in development, you could easily have, uh, you, you reach this, this barrier where, where you've gone from animal research committee to a specialized process. Um, but you know, you can predict that. Generally, you can predict what's gonna happen. Now, as I said, using these techniques like Bass's complementation, you might be able to push things and bias things in favor of having a higher contribution of um, human cells to a particular organ. If you could just close, Robin, by saying what you hope people will get out of these guidelines and what they say about the need for public input and dialogue. So what we hope is that these, the new version of the guidelines will actually give reassurance to um, the public um, uh, that stem cell scientists are reasonable and that we are willing to accept to work in a particular framework. Um, where that framework seems to be touching up upon what was previously ethical barriers, we want public input into how much we can take experiments. And that includes particularly this, the 14 day rule. So we are, um, you know, the, the guidelines say they serve this valuable purpose to give scientists a space in which to work where they have confidence that there will be public support. So we have to talk to the public, make sure we have that public support. So public, in, public dialogue is, is really important. And we also hope, of course, so, you know, the UK has all these, very good regulations um, in general regulatory processes, whereas many other countries do not. So parts of the world have no, no relevant regulations. Uh, we hope the guidelines will provide a framework for those countries uh, to develop their own uh, regulations, their own laws. And um, then we will have hopefully a, a good standard uh, that can apply across the world. Thank you ever so much for your time, Robin, and I hope we can talk again uh, about genome editing in particular, uh, because I know you're involved in a very important project by the World Health Organization uh, that will address genome editing and that relates to many of the issues we've just been discussing. I look forward to that.